please uh, give me uh, the questions uh, written so that we can resume. Well, the problem is that so far I have three questions. They are all for Cato Lawrence, and I don't see Cato. Uh, and we, we all agree that I'm not supposed to answer on behalf of Cato, so... <laughs> Ok, ci siamo quasi pronti. Abbiamo un piccolo problema tecnico. Qualcuno ha preso per errore la borsa di Dorenzo del cancelliere. Ora capite, prima di mandarvi di Svizzeri a controllare. Eh, Dorenzo, il cancelliere, ha perso la sua borsa. Provate a controllare, grazie. Ci sono vari libri diversi dal solito. Uh, so we can resume, as I told you, so far we have three questions, uh, they are all for Keto uh, Lorenzin, I, I give Keto the floor so that uh, he can answer these first questions, and uh, please uh, uh, give me in written uh, the questions you, you want to raise, and uh, this applies also for those Uh, who are connected uh, uh, online. Uh, so far, I do not read uh, any message uh, from them. Please, Kato. <laughs> okay, I'm on. All right, there are three questions. Uh, first, the, the first question is, what is the advantage of using um, the SASE cells, the synthetic artificial stem cells, versus the adult stem cells? And, and they're really, they're, they're, there are three or four main advantages. The first is that, um, To obtain uh, stem cells, uh, adult stem cells, you have to harvest adult stem cells. And there are different ways of doing that. The primary, if we look at bone marrow derived stem cells, the, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, the first way we do it for, you know, in terms of bone marrow is we actually, there's the area of the iliac crest where we can actually go, we drill in, and we can remove the adult stem cells from the area. 
that's actually a very painful procedure. And in fact, I've performed the procedure before in terms of extracting cells, and then six months later, the person says, I feel great, you know, my arm is cured, or you cured my other problem, but what's with this hip? It still hurts after six months. And so, um, and so it's, uh, it can be very painful. The other area, of course, is we can harvest adult stem cells from fat, uh, normally from doing a lipoaspirate or a liposuction procedure, which has a double benefit because you get a liposuction procedure out of it. But, the, uh, but of course, again, it's a procedure. It has its own uh, possibility for donor site morbidity. And so that's, the, so that's a downside in terms of having to do a surgical procedure. The, the second um, uh, disadvantage in terms of using adult stem cells is the immune response. If you decide to use allograft cells or cells from, out, from, from someone else's um, uh, adult stem cells, there can be an immune response that's there, um, which you don't see with our synthetic artificial stem cells. And then the third part, of course, are the extra effects. Uh, when one places a stem cell in a location, various things happen. You get some good things happening in terms of new you know, regeneration taking place, but also you have some catabolic things that are happening because the cells produce a, a variety of factors, some good, some bad, hopefully good at the end, but a variety. Whereas the synthetic artificial stem cells, we actually take factors that we know figure into the regeneration and we selectively use those factors for regeneration. So those are three of the major advantages. The fourth advantage, of course, is that it's an unlimited supply of synthetic artificial stem cells. If you're looking at stem cells from your bone marrow, you can harvest only so much bone marrow. From fat, depending upon your size, <laughs> you can harvest only a certain amount of fat. But, um, but with our synthetic artificial stem cells, we can create an unlimited amount for, uh, for treatment. Looking at the second question. Um, technically, could this technology not only regenerate bone, but, um, um, but also, uh, also increase the size of individuals? Uh, again, if someone is short, can you have people who are taller in terms of the, in terms of the different areas? Uh, yes, um, this is not only to regenerate, but also to generate. As you know, there are procedures that are leg lengthening and leg limb lengthening procedures that are actually um, in practice right now. There's something called the Elizarov procedure, which actually is a, can be used to, to not only treat fractures, but also leg lengthening. And when we think about regenerative engineering, we think about using a whole host of technologies that can, um, in the end, be able to enhance the regenerative process. So our typical methodology for leg lengthening is to make a fracture and then to do a distraction where we're able to regenerate, uh, regenerate uh, uh, the limb or lengthen the limb. And it's about an inch a month right now that we can lengthen a limb at using this type of um, bone um, um, procedure. Can you use other technologies? Maybe learning from the newt in terms of, you know, in terms of the cells that are responsible, SASE cells, other methodologies to be able to hasten and increase that rate? Yes. And so we can see this whole convergence approach could be very, very important to be able to add to our armamentarium right now in terms of the technologies that we have right now. <clears throat> and then the third question. Um, is do you think regenerative engineering will be affordable uh, for uh, for our health system? I think you know it's. I think we have no choice, but we have to. We it's not only affordable; it is going to be something that will benefit in terms of the overall our overall system, our overall healthcare system, will be of tremendous financial benefit. Let me give you an example. Um, an individual who is a bilateral amputee, if they have bilateral above knee amputations, the, the vast majority of those individuals cannot walk. They are in a wheelchair 
for the rest of their lives. Bilateral, above limb amputees, the majority never walk. They're in, a, they're in a wheelchair for the rest of their lives. Now think about if we were able to accomplish our work in regenerative engineering with our Hartford Engineering a Limb Project. Yes, it could be costly to be able to regenerate their limbs, but now you have a person who is walking, who is um, in society, being highly productive in society. And so if we, if, we, if we examine the entire overall value in terms of, and there are a number of ways, and my economist friend and colleague um, can explain and talk about you know, you know, uh, qualities, quality of life years, and how we can enhance the number of quality of life years and, and individuals using regenerative engineering and how those quality of life years translates to value in terms of uh, productivity and value in terms of the system. Uh, that value in the system translates to really a profit or increased uh, funding overall in terms of our healthcare system. <clears throat> the question I received was, can you describe how the WHO arrives at an ethical framework given the diversity of ethical perspectives of member states? Thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent question, which really goes to the heart of our uh, working methodology. In contrast to other international organizations, such as the European Union, which has the European Group of Ethics or UNESCO, for example, the IBC, WHO's working method is to establish ad hoc expert committees for a given topic at hand. There are a number of uh, downsides to this, but I would say the big advantage is that we usually um, get to choose the very best experts in the field at any given time, because 99% of the people we write to, they will say yes. Um, now, there's a requirement at WHO that our expert groups are very diversified in terms of gender, but also geography and also schools of thought. And uh, this is how we really try to balance the different um, ethical and technical approaches. So typically we would have expert groups of uh, 20 to 30 uh, people from all around the globe, and uh, they will then uh, try to reach a consensus. Now, some of the issues are, of course, very um, difficult to deal with, very sensitive. And uh, as you know, it's uh, in ethics, it's almost by definition the case. So uh, often it is difficult to find a consensus. Uh, this is why sometimes you will find stronger formulations where there's a you know, full agreement and sometimes maybe a bit weaker formulations. We will try as a secretary to push as far as we can, but uh, sometimes the international you know, consensus is just not there um, completely. And so the, you know, the result is the documents that you, uh, you see. Um, I still think it's, it's very uh, important even to have, uh, you know, uh, sometimes a minimum consensus on things maybe that are completely out of question and outside of a uh, international human rights framework, for example, uh, even though you cannot always resolve every uh, single question by consensus. Thank you very much. Um, now I have <clears throat> a question for all speakers. Uh, I, I see that uh, Noella is not with us anymore. Uh, can you confirm it to me from the secretariat? No. So uh, uh, the question is as follows. To avoid the debacle, uh, the world experience with uh, plant GMOs and food being widely questioned or rejected, should we first ask the people around the world if they want the technological advances we are so excited about? 
So I think you can be the first one to answer. <laughs> I, I would like to explore your question talking about my field, okay? The digital health. And uh, as I could tell you, uh, this, despite of the scope of such technologies to save lives, to reduce inequalities of access, eliminate kills, decrease coverage gaps, and expand the integration of primary care and specialized care in the diagnostic medicine sector. There tends to be an inverse in relationship, as I told you, between labor, productivity, and quality. Without ignoring these problems, it's necessary to be aware to public health system and the development of policy that adopts the re recent digital transformation associated with the development of communication and information technology, notably our artificial intelligence or machine learning in configuring a new public health Big data joins together with intelligence artificial, the, the tree of them that sustains the frontier of the advance of new technologies as advance of processing capacity followed by the expansion of the connectivity. It remains to be seen whether the allocation of more financial resource in this area implies an improvement in the quality of healthcare clinical and epidemiological indicators in meeting the health needs of the population. Having, this is my point, an idyllic vision of technological innovations seems to us to be a mistake because in the public sector, not in the market, but in the public sector, it is not to be efficient. In the public sector, it's not enough to be efficient, to do it economically. It is also necessary to be effective, to do what is necessary and ethical. So last but not least, I'm concluding, this issue is primarily a political decision, given the conflict between neoliberal macroeconomic conditionalities and health policy statements under the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The quick development of digital health needs to be supported by the necessary regulatory oversight to enable sustainable development. So I don't have this kind of idyllic vision regarding this technological transformation. That's my opinion. Kato? I have a specific view about new technologies that are being offered to the South. And I think that, um, I believe that new technologies that are offered to the South must be of the same quality or higher quality that are offered to the North. And in my experience, that's what I see is that sometimes the technologies that are being approached and the approaches that are provided because it's thought to be, it's going to the south are not as good as those in the north. Let me give you one example. So we have, um, you know, we have our senior projects that take place and I reviewed um, a senior project that was working in the area of, uh, it was trying to work in terms of a, 
uh, a uh, project for a, a country in Africa. And the proposal from the students, and they were very excited about this because they said, well, there's an issue about having enough fuel for cooking in these villages. And so we decided that we've got the perfect system. We will, we will go to the outhouses in the village and where people defecate, we will place a tube and that tube takes the funnel of the, of the methane that's produced by the defecation and we bring that tube into the kitchen and then we use the methane to cook food so they can cook their meals. And my point is that anything that you wouldn't do at your house as your idea, because no matter what, I don't think I'd like to use the methane that I produce after defecating to cook dinner, um, you probably shouldn't do for any, any other country or just be, you know, in terms of thinking that this is a third world country. Whatever technology you produce should be an innovative technology that you would use in your own world, in your own home. And people didn't like that when I said it. But that's what I think. I think that the technologies that we think about and the technologies that we want to use and utilize uh, in the South or all around the world should be the technologies that we feel are advanced ourselves and that we would use ourselves and not because we're doing it because we are or making compromises because of a place being uh, from the South or third world, et cetera, in terms of the technologies. And I think that's what I, that's what I see a lot of in terms of new technologies for the South that are being introduced, and that's what I, I advocate against. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that question, which in my view uh, you know, stresses the importance of uh, public engagement and uh, citizen engagement, citizen uh, consultation. This is a key area in ethics, of course, it has been uh, taken up by, by many international organizations. Our colleagues from UNESCO, for example, the Council of Europe has done a major piece of work on uh, public engagement. And then also in, in some countries in France, there have been um, uh, major engagement uh, exercises of, uh, of the citizens around the um, uh, bioethics law. Um, I think it's very difficult to do this at a global level. I mean, this is a bit of the dilemma. In a one way, we would need um, these kind of uh, consultations really globally, because you know, if you just uh, in one country make one decision, it doesn't mean that you stop the development of uh, or the use of these technologies in other countries, and eventually it will come back to your country as well. So there's a, a you know, it's it's a very difficult uh, um, undertaking. Um, at the same time, I think we have to try as much as we can to include the citizens, basically all, all of us, in these uh, discussions. Um, and so, for example, in the AI uh, work that I have been leading at WHO, we have uh, done various uh, uh, consultations with civil society organizations such as uh, Transparency International and, and other groups to make sure um, that we get uh, the voices and views, maybe not a representative sample, but at least um, some voices from the citizens of the world. And I think this is especially difficult nowadays with the uh, infodemics and uh, the fake news that we have in the social media where you know, there's wrong information spread deliberately uh, at times in, in you know, all kinds of senses. Uh, we just decided at WHO to establish a new expert group on the ethical issues associated with infodemics, uh, the ma management of fake news and uh, social listening uh, to try and, and establish some rules uh, around uh, this issue. Thank you. Uh, sure. yeah, one other observation I have is that um, and just as my colleague said, I think it's, again, very important that we embrace a wide range of views from a wide range of societies. Because in the end, um, technological advances and advances in our world will come from a number of different directions. Let me give you an example. So um, I was driving around Rome Great place, by the way. Um, uh, been here a few times, really like it. Um, 
but there's a lot of trash everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of bottles and plastic and paper that's sitting everywhere. Um, and um, about two months ago, I was in uh, Nairobi and I was playing golf. If there are any golfers here in Rome, let me know, I'd love to play. But um, I was playing golf and I put my tee, put my ball, we actually, it's a, you tee it up, you put it on a tee. And I'm about to tee off and the people at my, in my foursome, they started screaming at me. What are you doing? And I thought, you know, I'm teeing off. And they said to me, that your tea, yes, it's made of plastic. And I said, yes, it's made, of pl it's made of plastic. We don't use plastic here in Kenya anymore. Take that tea away. And I felt like I had offended everybody, which I apparently had. And so I took my tea away and used my, pla you know, used my wooden tea. As it turns out, there's a zero tolerance policy in Kenya for single use plastics. Now my tea is a multiple use, but I don't wanna make that argument with everybody during that time. But the point is, there is, a, there is it is outlawed in Kenya. And if you drive down the streets of, in, in, uh, in the cities in Kenya, it's pristine. There's not a bottle that's sitting in trash. There's the, the streets are, are absolutely beautiful. And so this is a policy that has really worked for that society. I mean, there's a lot of bottles around, <laughs> but this is, a, this is a policy that has really worked for that society. And it's, and it's really listening to the people and they're thinking about this at a very, very high level. And I think that, tech, that, that policy and that technology and that approach to technology is something that the entire world should be incorporating. Certainly they should, in downtown Rome, they should, and to think about. So it's really listening to people, but also I, I was really struck with the fact that, that technological innovation and innovations in the world will come from not just a set of countries, but from all of us to make change. Are there any other questions? No other questions? Mm. So, uh, if my voice <coughs> allows me to do it, uh, I would take this opportunity to add a couple of things uh, uh, concerning the last question. Uh, the first one, uh, you made the point of uh, the group of countries uh, uh, which make uh, the, the progress. So, uh, in the, uh, Andrea's presentation, there was a very meaningful passage about uh, the hubs of knowledge. This is a, a, a very important point. When I was at UNESCO, uh, we adopted, we, we, we wrote a, a report uh, on the principle of benefit sharing, uh, which had a, a crucial passage uh, about that. Uh, one of the problems uh, we have to address is the necessity to multiply uh, the hubs of knowledge. Uh, around the world, uh, coming to a different concept uh, of benefit sharing. Uh, that is the idea that benefit sharing is not a kind of trickling down or top-down uh, beneficence. Uh, benefit sharing should uh, uh, become more and more a kind of participation in producing knowledge and technology. Uh, wishful thinking, maybe, maybe, but I, I think uh, this is the, the main way uh, to, uh, to put uh, boots on the ground, uh, your, your, your idea, uh, in, a, in, a comprehensive, uh, in a comprehensive way. The, the second point I would like to make uh, uh, is the following one. Well, uh, the more complex 
the technology, uh, uh, the, the advancements of science become, the more difficult it is also to share the content uh, of these advancements in terms of appropriation, that is of autonomy, uh, of informed consent when it is the case uh, with people, not only in the healthcare domain. This is also a challenge. This is what we call health literacy uh, or uh, literacy uh, as a whole. Uh, this is not a challenge uh, just uh, uh, for uh, some countries. Uh, it, it is uh, an ever more challenging issue also for uh, the richest countries uh, in the world uh, because uh, it is about faults of inequalities uh, which are not only uh, among nations but also within nations. Uh, so I, I, I think that these are two points uh, that at the global level uh, we should focus on. Uh, uh, of course then uh, there is the, the, the crucial point uh, of sharing uh, uh, benefits that, that are produced somewhere uh, for all the people around the world who need it. Uh, when I, when I, I think uh, of limbs, uh, it is immediate. Uh, it is immediate, of course. But uh, maybe we have a new voice entering the debate. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't yet spoken, so... Um, my talk will <laughs> end the morning, but um, about Barbara, what yes, about about what you said now um, in terms of literacy, I think requires um, being echoed, but also requires a, a qualification. So, in 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 my own field, in the social studies of technologies and in science and technology studies, there's this notion of the deficit model. And the deficit model refers to the idea, to the false idea, arguably, that people will be more accepting of technologies and of, of technological advances when they know more about it. And in some um, configurations, the, the rhetoric on literacy resonates with the deficit model. And then what it does effectively, it puts the onus on literacy on the people themselves, individually. So sometimes then it's easy for policymakers to say, well, if people were more literate, they would be more accepting. Um, so they need to sort of work harder and understand better what, what's at stake. Um, I think it's very important that we emphasize the collective responsibility, and I'll say more in my own talk about this, the collective responsibility globally and also within societies to create the circumstances for this kind of literacy. You know, it would be quite bizarre and cynical to demand of someone who works hard to make a living to then also become digitally literate in, in, in the evening. So literacy, scientific literacy, is first of all a concept that goes far beyond the technology itself it goes around how, it, it, it's about in which context can we use it meaningfully and beneficially. And it's also really a collective responsibility, a public responsibility to create the circumstances within which everyone can access literacy as well as the technologies themselves. Yeah, thank you much, uh, Stefano, for these uh, wise words. Words, as as always, um, it's uh, really a, a key issue: uh, benefit sharing um, versus knowledge sharing. And I think actually, what the problem was with the pandemic is that um, the benefits were produced in the global north, and then there was no sharing. And so I think the, the new approach, because that has to be feared that it will, would happen again, 
is indeed knowledge sharing. So before the benefits are even produced, we want to spread the knowledge so that the benefits can already be produced um, in many more countries, including in the, in the global south. And uh, this is exactly the idea of the mRNA you know, vaccine production hubs. And actually, I forgot to mention um, my uh, former colleague, Professor Jean-Marie Okobele, who uh, was at WHO for a long time responsible for the uh, vaccine uh, program, and he's uh, now a member of the academy. So you have one of the prime uh, the, uh, experts in the world on this issue uh, uh, as a member. Um, I think the um, issue for LMICs is uh, really one of resource allocation, as we discussed uh, previously. So if you don't have enough money to even spend, you know, a few dollars on basic healthcare, how much should you invest in these new technologies, which are maybe more on the horizon of, uh, for the future? And this is a question we often get at WHO. I, I was in a, a, a workshop, a regional workshop of the Arab countries in Cairo uh, just before Christmas, and it was actually amazing how many countries, even the poorer countries are already investing in digital health and AI. For example, Egypt now has a virtual hospital that they're uh, building up. And um, still, it is a, it's a big question, also an ethical question. You know, how much should you care about now and uh, providing, you're know, spending your money on the care of patients now versus um, investing something, at least for the future, so that you're not further um, left behind by all these new technologies. Um, by the way, I'm sorry that Noella is not connected anymore, because this, if I, if I do remember correctly, uh, this is one of the points she made in her presentation. I think that, um, I think literacy is important, but I think trust is more important. In fact, I would say that trust is, in terms of the healthcare space, is more important than literacy. And that may be controversial, but I'll say it. Um, I'm very, I've been very much involved. I published the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities, which is the number one journal in the world in health, in, in health disparities among racial and ethnic groups. And I've been very involved in the COVID-19 discussions in the United States. And if you look at COVID-19 in blacks versus whites, there was a huge difference in terms of rates of, uh, in terms of rates of vaccine uptake among the black community versus the white community. And everyone thought it was, as we educate black people more, more people that, that, will, that will close. But it actually it wasn't, there's a certain point in which actually blacks were more educated than whites about COVID-19. Observe masking more than whites, observe precautions more than whites, knew someone who had died of COVID-19 at much higher rates than whites, but still would not take the vaccine. Because of trust issues, obviously traditional trust issues that have taken place in terms of the community with all the different things such as the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, and the modern areas that we know in terms of racial and ethnic health disparities in the treatment of black people in America in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of their health versus whites. And it was that, it's that mistrust area that, that created the hesitancy in terms of that, not the literacy part, because people knew about the vaccine and could tell you more about the vaccine than maybe you could. Um, and it really wasn't until um, there was a coming of mind saying, you know, you're intelligent, you know what's going on, let's have a conversation about what's been the history of black people in America in terms of, that, that currently goes on now, in terms of their mistreatment by the healthcare system, and that conversation, let's talk about where we should go from here. That conversation and that building of trust was what made a difference, and so last year at this time, was the first time in which actually the numbers of, by percentage, of blacks getting the vaccine was actually higher than whites. And it's because of the fact that that change, a bit of change in trust took place uh, versus health literacy, trust took place to allow that to happen.
I take the floor once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kato. I do absolutely agree with you. And maybe I can add something more. Whatever we can do to improve literacy, health literacy, education, I'm speaking for myself. I will never have the ability to really understand what you are doing. It is obvious. It is obvious. Given that uh, I have the ability to understand whatever other kind uh, of subject. But it is for sure that you are a very prominent specialist. The advancement of, te of scientific knowledge and technologies are so great and uh, uh, so over-specialized that only few people around the world can really share with you your knowledge. So a component of trust is unavoidable, is unavoidable. Uh, what I try to say that is that, uh, well, uh, as long as uh, we consider autonomy as a fundamental pillar uh, of our uh, societies, it is absolutely necessary to improve people's ability to understand what it is about, what it is about, at least what it is about. And it is about transparency, uh, public engagement, uh, and so on. But uh, in my opinion, uh, it is not a matter of uh, uh, putting uh, uh, literacy, uh, shared knowledge and trust one against the other. They have to move forward together. Uh, to try and put it in very simple words, uh, maybe we could say that autonomy, uh, uh, literacy and uh, uh, education is about autonomy. Trust uh, is about social cohesion. Uh, without trust, uh, we take the risk uh, to uh, have uh, other problems like the problems we had to face during the pandemic with people lacking trust, even though they were perfectly educated. So uh, I think uh, exactly looking at uh, uh, the advancement of new converging uh, uh, unbelievable technologies, uh, we have to, to try and move forward considering both aspects. We need to improve autonomy and participation of people through more education and literacy. At the same time, uh, we have to reinforce the bonds of trust uh, within our uh, societies. Needless to say, this creates uh, great responsibilities for those uh, who have uh, uh, the greatest and uh, more specialized uh, knowledge in the domains uh, that are going to become more and more crucial uh, for the survival, the well-being, the sustainability of our society. But at the end of the game, uh, we have to build uh, on sound scientific evidence, uh, but uh, it is not sound scientific evidence as such, uh, which can uh, help us uh, uh, to find out uh, the more appropriate solutions for our ethical and political problems. So we need both autonomy and trust. Sorry for taking it. We are some minutes ahead. Mm. No one is complaining about that. Uh, no, no one. No one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, we can move on.
to uh, the last presentation. Uh, we already know Barbara Prinzak. Barbara Prinzak uh, is professor for, com for comparative policy analysis, University of Vienna, and she is the uh, chair of the European Group on Ethics and New Technology. Technologies. Uh, the title of her presentation is uh, Challenges for the Future. The floor is yours, Barbara. Now it should work. Mm. Thank you very much to you for the introduction and I would like to echo my colleagues who have already thanked the Pontifical Academy for life and everyone who has helped to bring us together for a really unique experience. I would also like to add that I'm very grateful for how welcoming the organizers have been to our, not only to, our, to us, the speakers, but also to our um, companions, <laughs> and namely our family, and we really appreciate that. So I'm not going to start with a joke or a happy note. Um, I think and I'm grateful to Carlos that he has addressed this. The, the world is in a sad state. I don't know whether you also feel that. Um, many of us and many colleagues that I've spoken to feel that things are worse today than they used to be 10 years ago, five years ago. And this is not just some kind of um, idealization of the past, everything was better in the past. But let's look at the facts. Nowadays, fewer people are living in democracies than 10 years ago. I don't need to go into war and bloodshed and structural racism, violence against um, women. Um, so there's a lot of suffering around us and there's the feeling which we also addressed in the most recent statement of the European Group on Ethics, which I have the privilege to chair, there's, there's the, the feeling around that we are in a kind of poly crisis, um, a crisis that has become very intractable. So the disaster policy expert, Arjen Boim, calls it transboundary crisis. He says that nowadays crises are cutting across different domains of life and of practice more than in the past. They clearly go across boundaries, across national borders. Um, and while, of course, we could say that any crisis unsettles the established order of things, the beginning of our century has really seen a change in the nature of crises. They're nested into one another. If we think of the banking crisis, the COVID pandemic, the climate crisis, they, they cannot be isolated. It's so hard to, to act on them because they are, they are connected to each other and if we change one thing, everything else changes as well. And I'm setting the stage in this way because I think the a key meaning of the notion of converging technologies, and we've heard various definitions of converging technologies in the last two days, but one of the key meanings of converging technologies is also that they converge with our societal and economic order. So they are really part of the world we live in. We cannot isolate any type of technology and try to fix it and regulate it better and be more ethical about it without considering also the political economy within which it is embedded. So the role of technology is, if we understand it in this way, it's not that it causes the crisis. It doesn't cause any crisis, but it's involved in the practices that cause crisis and it can be, technologies can be involved in the solutions. They are deeply intertwined with the practices um, that, 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 that we all engage in. So I'm a political scientist by training, but as, as, as I think this is the main head that I'm here with, um, the chair of the European Group on Ethics. I would like to focus on what ethics and bioethics can do to tackle these challenges. And I think we're, we're not 
seeing even the beginning of the problem and the extent to which we are part of the problem. Let me explain what I mean. I will argue in, in the following that bioethics and ethics needs two things mostly. Um, the first one is, and I've discussed this also with uh, my dear uh, colleague and friend, uh, Professor Emmanuel Agius, um, who, uh, who I had the privilege uh, of working in the EGE with, bioethics is already expanding its scope in a way. So it's not dealing with medical issues and, and technological issues in the broad sense of the word, but bioethics is all over the world are already discussing a much broader range of questions, including um, planetary health, One Health initiatives, understanding that human health is intertwined with the health of other species. Um, also, we've heard about digital technologies today. Um, there's this notion of digital determinants of health that the Lancet and Financial Times Commission for Governing Health Futures is putting out. So digital practices are now accepted and recognized as determinants of health. So bioethics is already expanding its scope in that sense. But ethics also needs a new self-understanding to accommodate the complexity of planetary life. And, and that I think we're not doing. And, and I think it shows in many ways. Part of that is that while individual values and, um, and, and rights should of course remain an important concern of bioethics, we need to pay much more attention to collective goods and collective values as well. So don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that the public interest, whatever that is and whoever defines it, should trump the protection of individual rights. Not at all, this would be a grave misunderstanding, especially at a time when individual rights are being infringed, maybe more than ever. Maybe not more than ever, but definitely. That, that's a problem, a, hu a huge acute problem nowadays. But what I'm saying is that ethics has been not more powerful in addressing the structural problems, the roots of the problem, because it has very much focused on individual, supposedly individual needs and interests, where the, the, the common idea was that individuals are atomistic, game-maximizing entities. I'm talking about ethics as a discipline, I'm not talking about individual ethicists, and I'm certainly not talking about morality, which has often had a much, 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 much deeper and wider understanding of what is at stake. But in the field of ethics and bioethics, there has been somewhat of an individualistic fallacy that if we don't address that, um, we will not, not be able to get to the bottom of, of the problem. Um, the European Group on Ethics, by the way, has recently pointed out in, in uh, the recent statement on strategic crisis management, if, just if you're interested to read more about this, how individual and collective goods are not a zero-sum game. You do not need to have, you know, to, to, to compromise individual rights and liberties to obtain collective goods. They require each other. We cannot meaningfully exercise our individual rights if it's not safe to leave our homes for health reasons, because we are at, at, at risk of violence. And, and vice versa, you cannot have a flourishing society if there's no respect for individual rights and goods. So coming back to the argument, what about this statement, this observation that crisis, this is in policy papers all over the world, the argument is that crises are becoming more intractable. Part of, the prob uh, part of the problem with that assessment is I think that we tend to reify crises. Crises are not something out there that objectively exists. What we call a crisis as a society says a lot about what we find acceptable and what we don't find acceptable. So we accept death and suffering on a regular basis as a society without calling it in cr a crisis in some domains and not in others. So I think we need to be very aware of the performativity of what we call a crisis. Having said that, I think there is something to be said for the view that crises are changing their nature. 
Many of the crises of the 20th century stemmed from attempts of colonial and other powers to obtain, expand, or stabilize dominance. And while this has certainly not disappeared in the crisis of the 21st centuries, overall, crises unfold more rapidly, they hit harder, and they're even more difficult to contain. Partly because of global interdependencies, events in one part of the world in, or in one sector of our society affect all other sectors and regions much more quickly and sometimes even before we even realize what's going on. This is what the notion of a polycrisis conveys. And if you think about the um, COVID-19 pandemic, I think this was a clear illustration that that the virus was spreading before we even knew that there was something going on. But there's another part to the story. Um, we are now in a situation where our political and economic institutions are supposed to address the very problems that they have created in the first place. So, and this is why more and more academics, ethicists, activists, Politicians say it, something has to change. We cannot just stay at the surface. It's some people use different terms for that. Some say extractivist practices that characterize our economies that make people sick and destroy the planet. Again, think of the COVID pandemic just because it's still with us. What has created, what has turned this crisis into a pandemic or this epidemic into a pandemic was not the virus alone. It was hypermobility, it was the exploitation of human labor, the flying of um, exploited um, laborers, among other things, to and from Italy, and cruise, um, cruise ships, hypertourism, all of those practices have accounted for the fact that this became a worldwide crisis and has cost so many lives. So ethics and bioethics has an important role to draw attention to these things, as have colleagues in other disciplines, but especially ethics and bioethics. And as I mentioned, they haven't, ethics hasn't been able to tackle and even call out those structural roots enough. To illustrate this moving away from the uh, pandemic, let me give you an example from my old field of research, digital transformation, and also here, I'm particularly grateful to Carlos, who has drawn attention to the fact that digital technologies are not always when they can be adopted. They're not always only a blessing. They disempower sometimes in unexpected way, and they can empower in expected ways. But let's look at the role of ethics in digital transformations. Every, the, the, the primary concern of ethicists in digital transformation has been privacy. And of course, privacy is important. Also here, I ask you not to misunderstand me. I'm not saying, like Mark Zuckerberg does, um, privacy is sort of, young people don't care about privacy anymore, let's forget about it. That's not what I'm saying at all. Privacy is and remains an important individual and collective good. But there are so many other almost more pressing issues around um, digital transformations that ethicists haven't really enough paid attention to. Technology companies influence elections, um, not only technology companies as last week's, last week's news showed. Um, private entities can pay a couple of millions of dollars to meddle with election outcomes. Um, Technology companies shape research agendas and in some countries take over state functions. To name just a few examples in the field of health, there has really been a structural shift in the, last, in the recent decades. Big business in the medical field is not only big pharma, it's now big tech. Big tech have joined healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers and regulators as key players in the field. Sometimes they perform several roles simultaneously. They create the technology, they own the data, they develop the software, and through the philanthropies that are attached to technology companies, they shape research agendas. So university researchers are applying to tech philanthropies for, for money, meaning we've seen this in the, in the field of global health, Private philanthropies, as wonderful as they are, sometimes push out 
publicly accountable public actors. It, it leads to a divestment of public funding in the area. And, in, and at the end of the day, we have a couple of guys deciding where the research priorities are. I think this is a huge global justice and also social justice problem that is not attended to. Um, they also run research institutes to provide research funding. Um, they, they steer and shape research agendas by setting up institutes and providing endowed chairs. And if colleagues then say, yes, but this cooperation between business and um, public, public research, public funding, uh, public uh, science has always been there. There's nothing new about that. I would say it's wonderful to have public-private collaborations, but what's new here is the sheer size of it. And it's also new that there's a lot of investment now from technology companies in ethics and regulation. Many of the endowed chairs are chairs for ethics um, or chairs for the regulation of technology. So I think this is something that we really, really need to attend to. Another example from my own field of research, and I think this is a positive example of what ethics could do by drawing attention to these structural um, factors that, that can lead to crisis, exacerbate crisis, but also help to prevent crisis, is precision medicine. So most of my research, not, as, not in the EGE, but my, my research as an academic focuses on, um, on, on social, regulatory, and ethical aspects of precision medicine. So precision medicine, as you know, um, refers to the idea that um, the one person's asthma is not the other person's asthma, or maybe cancer is a more a recognizable example here, um, because of the, our differences in our genetic makeup, in our lifestyles, um, the expression of diseases in one person is not the expression of diseases in another, and thus we need different types of treatments that are tailored to individual characteristics of individuals. And ethics has so far focused on several aspects of personalized and precision medicine that are ethics with a small e, um, individual privacy and individual choice. I think here it's also um, this um, individualistic fallacy of ethics that I have uh, already mentioned, but also, as a positive example, ethicists here have also focused on does precision and personalized medicine um, threaten the principle of solidarity in healthcare where it exists. We know that there are countries in the world that without a solidaristic public health care system, but where it exists, does precision and personalized medicine hollow out the solidarity principle? And ethicists have really drawn attention to questions of equity. We heard also in the previous session about that. What good is a very fancy treatment if the diagnostic tools are not even available? Um, wh what about countries where most of the people don't have access to basic healthcare services? So ethicists have done a lot of good work there. Ethicists have drawn attention to um, the fact that a lot of research in precision and personalized medicine has been carried out primarily on um, people with um, European ancestries, um, so that a lot of the knowledge that was created wasn't applicable to most of the people in the world, it's structural racism um, in, and also structural sexism, of course, but here particularly structural racism, not only in who can benefit from the fruits of precision and personalized medicine, but also in, 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 in research, in who can participate in the research. So I think drawing, quest, drawing attention to these structural equity concerns, not only by saying we need more equity, we need more deliberation, that's quite easy to say, but by teasing apart and making specific suggestions also for policymakers what can be done to tackle those inequities, to tackle those structural uh, problems um, pertaining to the political economy of things is one thing that ethicists can do. So why don't more, why don't they do that already? Why is it still quite rare for people to engage in these ethical questions with a, with a 
uppercase E. And I think the reason is that institutionalized and professional ethics suffers from the same biases as other institutions in our societies. And what I mean here is not that when I, when I talk about bias, I don't mean normative positions that we can argue on the basis of our religious, moral, other standpoints, on the basis of our experience, of our embodied experience. That's not what I mean. I mean certain assumptions that we accept without questioning it. Um, what one could talk about this as some kind of hegemony, and I don't mean this in the Gramscian term as um, cultural hegemony, but I mean it in, in a, in a, as this kind of imaginative captivity. The things that we are so, that we take for granted that we no longer question it. I give you examples. The idea that the economy is a separate part of society that observes its own rules and we shouldn't interfere in it. As Polanyi showed, this is a very recent idea and it's not to be taken for granted at all and has caused great harm. A lot of people are writing about this in the, at the moment. We need more democratic control and democratic understanding of what the economy is and does. The second thing, and again, lots of people, governments all over the world are now addressing this. Economy, critical economists are addressing this. Why do we accept that economic growth is or growth in general is measured as it is? Why is it GDP that should grow and not something else? such as well-being, health. So there is some movement in this field, but we're still, we're still in this idea that, and especially also in the, in, in, the European, uh, in the European context, where, econ where economic well-being is pitched against sustainability agendas, for example. Um, I think we need a different understanding of what should grow and what our economy should serve. Um, and that's what I mean by by hegemony. Let me say something about the power of hegemony because I end with some suggestions of what we should do. One common meaning of hegemony is it is a lasting grip on power that allows the power holder to dominate a political arena effectively and in societies where competition and economic growth are dominant values, hegemony means that people strive for these values without questioning those values anymore, without anyone standing behind them with a whip. We have internalized these values. This is what hegemony means. In, in our book, and I realized that I was so um, engrossed in my own argument that I, I, didn't, I didn't move the slides, but so this book, rather than uh, telling you the, the title, um, you can see it here on the slide. Um, Hendrik Wachner and I put forward a concept of hegemony as a kind of unrecognized imaginative captivity. It's a, it's a situation where we, as a society, are collectively unable to see beyond our cognitive, moral, and political, and practical horizons. And that is not sort of victim blaming. Eh? We, we live, all of us, live, work, breathe, and appreciate in the world that makes sense to us, where most of the time situations are reassuringly self-evident because we've been socialized into a system of judgment and a way of seeing and doing things. Wittgenstein actually described this with the image of a man who's captured in a room with a door unlocked. You, you might remember that. So a man is captured in a room with a door unlocked. Why? Because it doesn't occur to him that the door opens inwards and not outwards. So it simply doesn't occur to him to pull at the door instead of pushing it. And I think what, what we need, and all of us need to do, and what ethics and bioethics needs to do is to, to pull instead of push. What does it mean for us to pull instead of push? What is it that we just accept because we've been socialized into it without any good moral, ethical reasons for this? And hegemony is quite powerful, understood in this sense, because it also has a firm hold on our ethical appreciation. It opposes, imposes a particular, I would even say moral order and hierarchy on, on, on how we understand society. Think of the intellectual authority, 
authenticity that it confers to some experts and withholds it from others. Think of the awe with which the pronouncements of central bank presidents or captains of industry are received by the media, whereas young people demonstrating and protesting against political inability to tackle climate change, they're dismissed as climate terrorists or hippies. So this is not a given. It contains a particular valuation of what is, what, what, what is worth something in our society. Um, so by imposing a sense of what the right order of things is, hegemony influences also our ethical judgments, to, to constraints or perceptions, our sensibility and our repertoire of activities to the point that we cannot even imagine a world that could be different. This is what my colleague Jana Bacevic said recently. Um, she said, you know, when, when people draw attention to the suffering of so many people in the world and others shrug their shoulders, not because they are necessarily, they don't care, but Bacevic says it's often because we cannot envisage a future for which it is worth acting in the present. This is also what hegemony means. So the conclusion is that the inability, our collective inability to change, is not so much a psychological quality, you know, you're not ready to change, you're not convinced, but it's because we are caught in a web of practices. When the solutions to improve a given situation are framed in the same terms as the very situation we seek to change, we are in a hegemonic situation. Or, alternatively, when reasonable proposals are met with incredulity, dismissed as impractical or not worthy of serious discussion, this is another sure sign that you find yourself caught up in a hegemonic situation. So for bioethics to be prepared for the challenges of the 21st century, it's, not it's important but not sufficient to broaden the range of topics we talk about, the future of work, planetary health, zoonosis, that's not enough. We also need, it is also not enough to include more marginalized voices, as important as this is. We really need a new kind of cosmology that takes the connectedness of all entities of, of, on this planet seriously, and with it new categories, ontologies, and instruments that fit this new cosmology. So to, to end, how do we get there? Well, in a way, one could say we're already on the way. In bioethics, there are, the, 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 the discussions are changing, um, topics are changing. Already in 2016, the, Amer the American uh, bioethicist and former president of the Hastings Center on Bioethics, Bruce Jennings, diagnosed a relational turn, this is how he called it, in bioethics, which he described as an approach that, quote, corrects the excessive atomism of many individualistic perspectives. Again, Jennings is not arguing against the protection of individual rights. What atomistic individualism means uh, is an approach that assumes that because society consists of individuals that are ideally independent from one another, and we aren't, and neither are we independent of our non-human non uh, species on the planet. Jenning argues that such a relational approach rejects the idea that people can be abstracted from their social and natural environments from their, as he calls it, ecological place. And here Jennings already points to another aspect that's becoming increasingly important in, in, the, in the next decade, of actually after 2016, namely the great extent to which the lives and practices of humans are intertwined with those of non-human species and also um, connected in a complex web of, um, of relations. So complexity thinking, we haven't heard so much about it, this explicitly today and yesterday, but it was there in a number of talks. There's a rise in complexity thinking in many areas. And complexity thinking is not the same as saying things are complicated. So a combustion engine is complicated. It's very difficult to construct it, but it's not complex in the deep sense of the word. Complexity is characterized by so-called emergent properties, by things that emerge because the elements in the system interact. 
So the unfolding of the COVID pandemic, to use this example as a la last time, one last time, the unfolding of the COVID pandemic is a classical example of complexity. You cannot control, you cannot predict because you don't know all the individual elements. And many of the current challenges that bioethics is concerned with at the moment, biotechnologies, digital transformation, and the health impact of climate change would benefit and benefits from perspectives and approaches that harness such complexity. Um, it, again, it doesn't mean that we should throw our hands in the air and say everything is so complicated, let's not do anything anymore, but it means that we need to play along with complexity, to harness it. Um, how do we do that? And I will end with that. How do we do that? So we, we do that but by adding, among other things, another key metaphor of how th things hang together. We have had engineering so far as a kind of guiding metaphor for societal challenges. And thank you. So engineering has been, you know, think of the moonshot cancer initiatives. Think of um, Commission, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who called the European Green, De Green Deal as Europe's man on the moon moment. So she framed this also as an engineering project. And obviously engineering is wonderful and we have a lot, um, we, we owe a lot to engineering, electrification, pharmacology, information and communication technologies, machines revolutionizing agriculture, transport, education, all of that was partly and sometimes solely due to engineering. There's nothing wrong with it, we, we continue to need it, but engineering is not a good metaphor for some of the more complex challenges in our world. Engineering hinges on precision and the ability to predict, to calculate precisely how a tool or a machine or a system will behave and impact on its particular slice of the world. It's, it's ultimately a project to control a particular system, otherwise it wouldn't work. But for complex challenges such as climate change, such as violence and war, we cannot be in control of the planet. Neither can we be in control of human health or in control of the climate. No, no matter how much engineering has helped us to increase health prosperity and progress and how helpful the engineering metaphor has been in driving home that human ingenuity and perseverance can tackle the most difficult challenges or at least some of the most difficult challenges in connection with complex challenges that we are currently grappling with. We need more gardening. This is what this slide shows. Gardening is not mastery but it's relation. Despite its most well-informed and precisely planned attempts to create a garden in a specific design, a gardener will never be able to exactly design and then execute a plan. She cannot foresee the temperature, the wind, insects, parasites, and so on. So a gardener can sow the seeds, plant the seedlings, tear out the weeds, but she can never fully master the garden. And ethics, also policy making, but ethics needs more of this turn to gardening. Most of the issues that we're grappling with cannot be addressed with quick fix technological solutions or even more literacy as we discussed. Trust is a gardening metaphor, a gardening concept. So we cannot, we cannot really get to the bottom of, of our problems and start to address them without having such a new concept of how things not only hang together but how they develop together and what our place as humans is in this interconnected web of flows, energy and materiality, we cannot take us out of this. In the words of my colleague uh, César Atuir, um, we need a revisitation of the frameworks and conceptions of health, research and ethics to ensure first that they are not unjust towards indigenous knowledge systems and that they are open enough to include both indigenous and foreign knowledge systems. So this is one aspect that he focuses on, but I think especially also African concepts of bioethics, um, care ethics approaches have a lot to offer. I will not go into the notion of epistemic justice by Miranda Fricker and epistemic injustice, but I think this is also a very important notion in this regard. And I think here the circle closes. 
to the, la to the very first talk that opened our meeting, Amber Rogestrand, who suggested that what, what, what currently doesn't count needs to be counted. I would like to echo, echo a Roger suggestion and even go a step further. Um, we need to really have new metrics of what we measure for the good in the world. We need, as Roger said, science for human flourishing, but we also need an ethics for human flourishing and needs to, it needs to be much more assertive. Ethics cannot be something that tries to make things a little bit more ethical within the current order of things that has created some of the most pressing problems in the first place. Ethics needs to set agendas. It does so, but it doesn't do it enough. And also Roger said, we need to listen, need to listen better to peripheral voices. I think, well, nobody could disagree with that, but it's, we, I would also like to be more assertive and more bold and to say it's a matter of justice that we don't only listen to the ones that are already speaking, but we're listening out to those that are not already speaking, and we also see how they frame the problems. A lot of the problems that we discussed in this panel today emerge from the fact that technocrats, elites such as us, are framing the problem and not people for whom we're designing solutions. So also here, ethics needs to be, in this sense, more political, not in any partisan way, but it needs to be more political in that it really um, goes to the core of what m makes life worth living. And I think um, the Pontifical Academy is the right place to do this, to start this discussion and to continue this discussion. Thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to uh, the discussions. Uh, Barbara, uh, we have um, eight minutes left uh, and uh, uh, three questions uh, and uh, a critical observation. Uh, so try and indicate the path for, for the answer. First question, <clears throat> who or which organization do you think should fund research uh, as you disagree with private funding? Governments, WHO, through taxes? So, first of all, I do not disagree with private funding. I think this was a, I, and I didn't say this, and um, if, if, uh, if this is how it came, came across, I should take this opportunity to say that private funding has its place, but when it comes to especially also human health, global health, um, when it comes to disease research, it's a very dangerous place to go to allow a full retreat of public funders. I think there's a, an important role that both private and public funding needs to play. And if you look at, for example, the work of Lindsay McGoy, who has shown this for the field of global health, where public philanthropies have enabled the agenda setting or, or have more or less taken over agenda setting and pushed back other um, publicly accountable um, organizations, then this is something that, um, that I personally see as a, as, a, as a person who has democratic values, I see this um, with some concern. Um, how can we pay for this? Um, this is a long debate that we, I'm happy to go into, but I won't do unless prompted. Um, we have money for a lot of things. We need to have money for health um, and health research. And I think this, is, this should be more on the priorities of, of, of public policy agendas and not less. Second question. <clears throat> I hope I'm reading correctly. A person-specific focus in medicine, ethical actions, education, and other areas, challenges, conventional methods of science. How will such methodology be legitimated and supported? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, a person-specific focus in medicine, oh, ethical okay. actions, education, and other areas, challenges, this person-specific mm -hmm. focus, challenges conventional methods of science. How will such methodology 
be legitimated and supported? Thank you. Now, this is a very, very good question. So the way I understand it, 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 it pertains to personalized and precision medicine, and it asks if we, if we really go as far as saying every, every person's disease is not every other person's disease, how can we, for example, still um, run uh, randomized controlled trials? How can we lump patients together into groups when everyone is so different from everyone else? So this is a debate that is actually going on. Um, the short answer is that some new methods such as in silico modeling, um, N1 in-depth studies, deep phenotyping, um, start to complement um, old methods of evidence creation. So it's not so much that, um, that, the, that, that the traditional, quote unquote, methods of evidence creations are phased out, but they, um, they start to complement them by um, really in-depth studies of, of, of individual cases, by modeling in silico, as I mentioned, and also in oncology, of course, there are um, now new trials that, uh, that are anchored in molecular characterizations rather than symptom-based um, symptom characterization. So that's one, that's the short answer to the question. I hope I understood it correctly. A third question. <clears throat> Is overcoming the hegemonic forces you discussed only an ethical issue? Is it also a moral issue? Yeah. Yes, thank you. This is, thank you for this question. I would say it is also a moral question. Why I called it an ethical one is that, that I see hegemonic thinking more in people and approaches that don't have a clear moral agenda. Because a moral agenda in the positive sense. Because if you know what your morals are, then very often, but it, it, it happens relatively rarely, that things are not challenged. That things are just be accepted because this is how they are. Um, whereas in, in ethical debates that in a way forget about the moral grounds for certain positions, and I don't mean only religious roots, there are, there are also um, moral roots in humanism and in other perspectives. So ethical approaches that don't discuss the sort of moral grounds for particular positions are more vulnerable to this type of hegemony as I understand it, Hegemony means just that we accept things as they are because, because they've always been this way. And that's the dangerous thing. So I'm, I'm not arguing against um, people holding positions that are not, um, that are not uh, accepted by everyone if they have a clear understanding of what the moral grounds are um, for them holding this position. As I said, this is a, a critical observation more than a question. I have never heard the word education. Education is the key. Education is the challenge. What is your reply? Thank you. Yes, um, I should have. I should have. I don't. I'm looking around because I don't know who wrote it. So, thank you. I, you're right. I should have talked about education as well, because I, it, I think. It, I hope it was implicitly there. When I say that it's necessary to challenge and to question things that we just accept as given, then education can start. Elementary education can start. Why don't we teach our children more about how the economy works? The economy is something that we all have a part in. We shouldn't leave it to experts. The same goes for um, what, what a lot of colleagues have already said. Um, giving children as much as we can also digital skills is, is a matter of pre-distribution, right? Not redistribution, but pre-distribution. If you give children education, including digital skills, um, scientific understanding, then they have a better place 
they have a better position to start into the world and it's a more equitable starting point. So absolutely education is key. What still, I, it's very important for me to say, and I meant, tried to convey this earlier in my intervention in the discussion, sometimes education is a bit of a, by policymakers, a bit of a cop-out when they then say, yeah, we can't solve this, it's a matter of education. So absolutely yes, if education is something that we take collective responsibility for. Education should not be an excuse that we're not solving problems because somebody else should do it. The teachers should do it, the parents should do it, they should educate the kids better, right? But if we all do it, then absolutely yes. And thank you for this uh, critical remark. So, once again, thanks to the speakers, to all of them, we are perfectly on time. Uh, as you probably remember, now we are called on to comply with a fundamental moral uh, ethical duty, uh, that is the group picture uh, outside. Before that, Fabrizio uh, wants to say something. Ok, sì, due piccole cose. Abbiamo le fotografie disponibili, quindi i nostri accademici riceveranno nel pomeriggio una mail con un link per guardare le fotografie. E ne, domani o dopodomani ci saranno anche le altre fotografie, quindi ci sarà sempre una mail con un link. Le fotografie sono su Flickr, quindi potete guardarle, potete scaricarle come desiderate. Riceverete una mail, via mail ci saranno tutti i link per questo. Adesso eh, invece gli speakers, i relatori, sarà cura della Segreteria Generale dell'Accademia mandarvi il link con le fotografie eh, per, per scaricarle e guardarle. E, naturalmente stiamo, sto parlando delle fotografie della, del nostro workshop, della nostra riunione, le fotografie, le fotografie del Papa hanno una gestione separata. Adesso, per cortesia, eh, dobbiamo fare, facciamo la foto di gruppo, quindi andiamo fuori, qui all'ingresso, per, per la foto di gruppo. Grazie.